I would like a big applause for my friend Serge Plan. Um, am, I, am I that low? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you, Pascal. So um, I'm very pleased to um, have the opportunity to present some of the work we are doing and we will be doing in the context of, um, uh, well, it's a context that I would say not very pleasant for coral reef right now, and I will emphasize that a little bit in my presentation. So, as you see, I'm speaking in English. I could have made it in Catalan, but I realized that it would be much easier to make it in, in English for people to understand around, around the room. Anyway, so let's talk about rapidly about the CREOB. It's a research center. Um, of course, I would have been blamed by all my friends if I wouldn't, and colleagues if I wouldn't present about where it is. It's at the bottom of the Bay of Opunu, if you have the chance to come to Moria, which is, to me, one of the nicer, if not the nicer islands in French Malaysia. So I certainly, <laughs> I think the tourism uh, organization in Moria will be very happy of me saying that. And I'll certainly uh, um, suggest you to come and visit. You're welcome to come anyway. So it's a research center established since 1971 in French Malaysia, as you can see from the two view. 1971, 19, uh, 2016, it's changed radically. Of course, the research has changed, tools have changed, and I will talk about the tool, actually, about that. So it was a nice, uh, small uh, house along the beach uh, in 1971. It's a sort of more bigger center now in 2016. Um, the research of the club is really linked and totally associated with the, the history, basically, and the knowledge of the coral. And, We've been mainly, mostly focusing on the coral, the coral reef, the ecosystem, and natural history of the ecosystem, and of course, threat of this ecosystem, a recent threat of the ecosystem. So you, you have some view about working both experimentally and uh, looking at the natural evolution. If we talk about the, nat the coral, and I couldn't sort of, um, as a scientist, I couldn't sort of um, stop me presenting a few images of the coral. First of all, the coral, and I hope everybody in the room knows that, this is not a plant. This is an animal. <laughs> this is a living animal. But it's a complex animal, and I will come on that. It's a complex animal because, because it's a based on an anemone that you have in a very high resolution uh, with several tentacles. And that anemone builds a skeleton, and that skeleton that is not internal, that is external, a little bit like a shell, basically making its own sort of a shell around, around it, um, um, that animal sort of builds big things. Um, one of the important things of the coral, here you have one of the tentacles of these, these anemone. So in that tentacle, all the little bubbles that you have in that tentacle are a zooxanthellae. It's an algae. It's an algae. So this is why it's an animal that hosts algae, that hosts a plant, basically, single cell plant but 90 to 95% of the energy of the coral come from that plant, come from that algae. And 90 or 95% of that energy come from the sun that arise by basically that uh, small algae that is called zooxanthellae. And you can see that for one cubic centimeter of coral, you got one million cells of that algae. So this is essential. And this is a very important aspect, especially in recent days. So, the other point about the coral, the coral are making colonies, and those colonies are made of clones. So here, for example, all the different sort of individuals that you have are exactly the same. They are clones. They, are, they have exactly the same genetic material, which means in some ways that they are as fragile one to the other, and that's a big point when we talk about threat. Um, and then, of course, this massive animal, uh, this, sorry, this small animal that we've seen are making massive colony, such as this one, around 4,000 years old, and they're making the biggest bioconstruction on Earth. And this is what coral and coral reefs are, make, are making. This is the, the biggest and the largest bioconstruction on the Earth. You can talk about Australia, you can talk about New Caledonia, you can talk about Mexico, Belize, uh, Barrier Reef. They're all sort of made from that single small animal. And this is in, in the recent sort of evolution of what we call biomimicry uh, research development. Actually, coral is actually a lot more investigated into how we can build from this small, 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 small brick something that is actually one of the biggest things that we have in Earth and how we can 
derived from that sort of way of making sort of a construction, uh, some experience from that. And I think that even in the context of uh, whatever islands, whatever development we can do, that's something also that can be think about, about how to take something that is very small, very simple, and make it in something that is very big and very complex in the end. Um, just a couple of other things for regarding uh, uh, the overall coral reef in the world. Not that much, actually, 0.2% of the ocean, almost nothing. But it's 20%, sorry, 30% of the biodiversity of the ocean, so which makes that as a big target for conservation. Because by conserving and preserving 0.2% of the ocean, you're preserving 30% of the biodiversity of the ocean. So that's why it's also a target for conservation. And I will come to the link with islands at some stage, natural and non-natural one. And this is actually a natural one that I'm sure around the room people would like to make it as a, as a uh, sort of a, a mimicry for, a, for a, an um, artificial one. This is a small atoll in French Polynesia. It's Nukuta uh, in the Tuamudu Islands. But to, coming back to French Polynesia and to the diversity and the biodiversity of coral reef, one square kilometer of coral reef is the same amount of biodiversity that you have along all the coast, the main coast of France. That's also one point that I'd like to emphasize in, into some of the politicians that we have sometimes when we, talk, when we talk about conservation and when we talk about where is the biodiversity of France in the French territories, and actually it's mainly in their overseas territory. And France owes about 5% of coral reefs for the world. But coral reefs, sorry, but coral reefs are not stable. This is a very unstable ecosystem, naturally unstable ecosystem, because you can have cyclones, you can have uh, acanthaster, which is the starfish that eats the coral, you can have many of different things that makes actually the coral, and that doesn't work, okay, but that makes the coral, sorry, going up and down. The red line here shows you the percentage of coral since 1975, actually, in French, in Moria, and you can see that it goes between basically 60% to almost 0%, and you have up and down. Most of those up and downs are natural. Most of those up and downs are like when you have a bushfire, basically you clean everything, and from that, things come back again. And if it's natural, if there's no additional threat on it, well, it comes back, and it comes back, and it comes back to this natural stage. But if you have events like that, then this is a little bit more dramatic. Uh, this is two-year conservative events that we have now, 19. 20, 2015, 16, 2016, 2017, where we have major bleaching. I was, until two years ago, a very optimistic person about what will the coral end up to. Um, yeah, I'm much, much, much less optimistic. We have in places like Rimatara, here in French Malaysia, for people living in French Malaysia, we have 95% of coral that are dead because of bleaching. And because, what, what is the reason for bleaching? It's high sea temperature which is a result of high and heating of our, uh, of our planet. And people that are talking that climate change doesn't exist, I would like them to go and dive in those places. Here, the Great Barrier Reef and Terry Hughes, one of my colleagues in, in, in James Cook, could tell you the same, about 50 to 60% of the, G, the GBR, of the coral the GBR that have disappeared in less than two years, in less than two years. And because the, the temperature is not going down, this will, will continue. Then you, you'll tell me, Nice story, what links with uh, uh, islands and with the conference that we have here. Um, in the case of the Creos, we are developing tools. Tools for um, a warning, tools for, um, for uh, making this message going to the public, not staying just in science. Tools for uh, 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 crossing the oceans with like uh, the Tara, and I will come to that. Trooms for crossing the oceans and investigating uh, the consequence of the depths of coral and the consequence of the change of that ecosystem. We are also developing tool for developing the, um, the uh, 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 experimentally uh, designed, and one of the tools is actually a floating sort of a floating and sometimes not floating system that we'll put uh, that I'll show you. Uh, so um, this is the opportunity to, uh, uh, and I'll come that. Oh, sorry. So one of the tools is the, the expedition that we're doing, which is a Tara Pacific expedition, which is basically to look at the whole microbiome. As you may know, there's a real revolution of the microbiome. Uh, microbes were also always you, and I'm sure that if I, if I ask in the room here, how do you see a microbes? I think you will all see as something that is harmful, that's something that is 
painful, that's something that gives you an illness. But there is a complete change on view of that. Microbes is not only something that gives you a, uh, um, um, an illness, it's something that you also need to be in good health. And there's a complete revolution on that. Revolution started with human, in human science, always, medical science, but it's coming, going now into other, other system and into the corals. That's one of the things we want to investigate. It. It's how much the threat that we have, which, has, which is, for example, the um, uh, global warming, or which is actually some of the acidification and other things going on, all those things are impacting the microbiome and the microbes that are attached to the coral, and then leading to destruction and then uh, a fragility of the coral. The other things that we are developing, thanks to uh, Jacques, who is here, and we'll be very happy to have that in full screen, uh, because he's been the architect for the, the, um, the nice view, and I'm sure that you all, all see that nicely, and hopefully it will start to be built by the end of the year. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a museum, and it's a museum that is a museum for nature. It's a museum to basically transfer to local community, to tourism that comes only for one or two days in those islands sometimes, and for people that are not diving, people that don't know what is under the ocean, people that are not walking in the bush and don't know what is in the land of those or most of the islands, to explain them what is there and how fragile, actually, and how fragile and how, um, how worried we can be about uh, um, um, maintaining the, the diversity of, of those islands and the biodiversity of those islands. Uh, the last thing that I'm going to talk, and which is this one really related to sea flo uh, floating, uh, floating islands, is that aside for that, we need science. We need to understand because science is something that whatever you're a politician or whatever you're a, just a, a, a user of the, of the nature, you understand by fact that there is a problem and people will tell you, oh, we don't know about that. No, we know that about that and we told you about that. And we need science and we need information for that. One of the reasons, and so one of the ways to do science is to do experimentally. So with, uh, with a structure like the Taha, we're doing that naturally, looking at the natural ecosystem, but we need also to do experimental science. So one of the things we were trying to develop in Moria was to build, build a sort of, sort of what we call a, a research station under the, the, the sea. Uh, this was also designed by Jacques, <laughs> by the way, by Jacques Rougerie, uh, but was not accepted. And I emphasize on that because we are talking about um, islands here, artificial islands, was not accepted by the local community because they said, we have a lagoon that is natural, we have a lagoon that is already uh, sort of uh, providing us, an, uh, and we want to maintain it, sorry, and we want to maintain it as natural as it is. And we don't want to have permanent infrastructure that may change the lagoon that we have. And I'm emphasizing that. This was clearly something that came out from the local community. So we changed the design. The importance for us is to be able to have a research station on site on which we can manipulate on site the coral and the reef through not just a piece of coral, but really reef structure, and then being able to say, here is the change that is occurring because we're able to measure in detail, in fine precision, some of the major mechanisms and processes that are driving change in the coral reef. So what we decided to go was, what we needed was to have a in situ um, uh, um, captures that captures different elements, in situ cameras, uh, to have um, uh, uh, gardens of nubbins of corals, to have uh, housing for, for coral and maintenance, and basically to be able to manipulate the reef as we could uh, and to investigate it, what will be the consequence on the reef, whatever manipulation. So the initial idea was that one, this was cancelled, and then we went to another idea, sorry, which is a floating boat that at some stage can stop, can put piles under the, on, on, the, on, the, on the ground, and then can be uplifted, and then you have a platform that you can move. It's a, it's a large platform that basically you move, and on that platform we have a full laboratory which, take, which, which can take us basically to wherever we want in the reef, stays on there, uplift the system, the system becomes a platform, not anymore a boat at all, and then from that platform we can investigate for three months, for six months, and for a year, even more if we need, and then from that we can just re-crank uh, re, um, the, the pile and then make it as a boat and go somewhere else and go there. So 
that is going to be a complete laboratory, which we will be able to, and I'm, my time is gone, because pa Pascal is coming. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I guess this is the message <laughs> behind that. So this is going to be a complete laboratory, floating laboratory, basically, that we can transport in one place to another place to another place. Uh, um, and we are encountering the same, I would say, problems that require some innovation. And it is one of the reasons why I'm interested, actually, in the seasteading and in the artificial islands uh, development is uh, we, it requires innovation about how to make the system sort of self-sufficient, how to make the system sort of being able to be, uh, to take care of the energy, to take care of the, the waste, to take care of all what we need and, and uh, on site and to be able to stay on the places for several months or, or even a couple of years to continue doing research on site. So that was the idea. So you got here a couple of frames. This is, should be in build early next year. We're just waiting for a final signature for uh, funding, but it's, it's been accepted on, uh, on its frame. And so um, we should be able to have that uh, available by, I would say, the end of next year. And if there are link in terms of technology and innovation between, I would say, the uh, islands, artificial islands, this is clearly one of the tools that can be used to test some of the technology on that time. And thank you very much. Merci beaucoup.